You're muted. We can't hear you. You're muted. I, I'm so happy to be with you today. And I'm really ready. You know, I think I've had sort of an epiphany this week. It's very interesting to um, just to notice for myself. And I feel like I, um, I want to share with all of you what's going on. <laughs> um, I feel like passion has come into my life over the past 30 years in so many extraordinary ways. And I think that for me, if you take nothing away from my talk today, what I want you to take away is to connect in with your passion and allow that passion that is yours to really drive who you are in the world and to really allow you to connect more deeply with others in the world. So um, I was thinking this morning when I was a little kid, my, my best friend was, was Care Bloom, Care and Fred Bloom. And they had a dad who was really different from my dad. They had a dad who would like build go-karts and he was always creating stuff. You know, my dad was kind of businessman and played golf and did stuff like that. But Care Bloom's dad built this swing on the side of their garage. And he put a ladder, you had to climb up the ladder holding the rope from this swing that was off on a great big huge tree in the middle of their yard. And as kids, we would hold, you know, you had to hold the rope and climb up the side of the garage and then you'd stand up at the end of the ladder, put the thing between your legs and the deal was you had to yell, let her rip. And you let go and you went flying over their yard. I mean, it was a little scary, um, but that has always been like, yeah, let her rip, you know, like there was such joy in that as a kid to do that. There was like a, a little bit of fear, but then once you let her rip, you were like, this was great. Let's do that again. Up you go, you know? So anyway, I was kind of thinking about that this morning while I'm in the shower. And I thought, this is a letter rip talk, okay? Um, so I'm gonna, I have some slides because I just have gotten crazy about doing this and I just think it's so much fun to be able to share things with people. So this right here is a guy, his name is Ravana and he's the 10 headed man. And you know, there's stories in India about Ravana um, and, and I guess what I want to say is I um, think I spent a lot of my life being the female equivalent of Ravana. I had all these different things going on inside my head and I was very confused. Um, I was just not feeling like good about my life in so many ways. Um, and for me, my strategy was to drink wine and then I saw, thought I felt better. <laughs> There you go. Uh, but what ended up happening was I found myself in a 12 step meeting. And in that meeting, there was this really calm woman. I was just like Ravana, you know, like Mrs. Ravana, upset about my husband, upset about my kids, mad at my mom and dad, not happy with my work. You know, everything was just doing that. And there was this really peaceful woman and, and, and she mentioned that she was going to unity. And I'm like, what is that? I want some of that. And so she took me to Unity. And this was 30 years ago, literally 30 years ago, I found Unity and I used to sit in the back and they would meditate and I would weep and I would run out the door because I didn't wanna to have to shake hands with the minister or meet anyone because I was just so beclimped. You know, I just like upset. At any rate, I've had 30 years of being in Unity and, and feeling the power of Unity, feeling how it totally changed my life. And somewhere along the journey in unity, I realized that it wasn't just me I needed to change, that there was something so incredible here. I wanted to be part of giving this to other people. And I became a licensed unity teacher and took the classes for that. And, you know, later ended up starting a church, which, you know, is sort of a crazy thing to do. But anyway, that's what I did. Um, so unity has been a grounding for me in my life for 30 years and really, really a powerful part of the passion that I have. It's one of the reasons that I really enjoy being a guest speaker, being part of this community here, here in Richmond. And also I've been speaking in Santa Rosa as well. But one of the things I've been kind of aware of is I haven't really brought a part of my passion 
in, into this church at all. Um, I've been sort of partitioning myself, partitioning my passion as it were, and, and speaking unity, speaking unity teachings, reading unity books, like really because I love it and I live by it, but I haven't ever really shared my experience that I've had in India, which has basically been 15 years of experience of going to India. I've been to India 20 times or so. Every year I go, I started, had my first experience actually in 2005 when a licensed unity teacher friend of mine had been to India and came to my office in Berkeley and put his hands on my head. And all of a sudden it was like, what was that? I think I want to go to India. So Roy and I went to India shortly thereafter, you know, 2006, March, I was in India. And, and I've had multiple experiences there um, and been, I've been connecting in ways that brought synchronicities into my experience, which told me I was in the right place. The very first time I went to India in 2006, they put me on a campus with Native American uh, and healers from all over the world. And there was a, um, a Mayan elder, his name is Don Alejandro from Guatemala, who was there. And he had been at my church. We'd done a fire ceremony at my church, Unity of Berkeley, several months earlier. And I'm like, whoa, this is an interesting little synchronicity. So things like that would start to happen. But what happened for me, my very first visit, was the awareness of the global experience that I had um, basically been drawn into because there were people from all over the world, from all different spiritual traditions. In this case, we had all these different native uh, uh, chieftains from various tribes in the US and Canada. We had um, elders from Zimbabwe. We had people from Peru, people who spoke different languages. Then there were people who were from different um, countries who were Buddhist or they were Muslims, they were Hindu, they were nothing, <laughs> they were Christian. Um, and, and it was very clear to me that what they were speaking was so much in alignment with what I had been living for the past 15 years as a unity student, as a unity teacher, and then as a unity minister. Um, over time, I had many experiences in India and um, I became a, uh, a oneness trainer in 2010. 2012, they initiated me to, to, to bring a transmission through my eyes. And I traveled around the United States. People would, would pay me to come. They didn't pay me. I went. They would pay my airfare. I would sit in front of people and do this meditation. And people would go into very big states. So I became aware and, and got to know people all over the United States. It was about a four or five year period when I was doing a lot of traveling. Um, then I also had a, an experience of teaching people as a, an advanced trainer, health processes, ancestor processes, wealth processes, family, family dynamic relationship processes. I also had the opportunity to create in my home, take, get rid of my office, which I'm sitting in half of right now, and create two sacred chambers that people like Kathleen um, and OSHA was on, but she's not on now. People would come to my home and we would sit and go through a process for two or three hours. And they would come and they would sit in these chambers and really have a deep experience of the divine. It was a, such a blessing for me to do. I packed up all my books and you know, didn't read for five years. I also then was trained to teach other courses and um, now I'm doing online courses. Three, day, three days a week, I teach online courses. And every day I do two daily meditations that are free meditations for people who come from all over. So, and again, it's not about me. This is not about me. This is about passion. It's about the passion that I have that I, it got ignited for me when I was able to connect and see how I'm not unique, how we're not unique. Even as unity students, we're not unique because there are people all over the world who believe and know and, and live their lives in the same way that Charles and Myrtle Fillmore taught us to live our lives. So I, I'd like to show you a couple of um, actually pictures of the place in, in India that I go to and just to give you a sense of the vastness of what this is. And, Part of it, part of what, why I'm saying this is that I believe this church, Unity of Richmond East Bay, you, this church has a potential to impact so many people. 
You know, when we grab our passion, we understand who we are and we get the gifts that unity gives us to transform our own individual life. We, we, we have to give it out. Otherwise we're like the dead sea. You know, Jesus talked about that all the time. That was the daily word today. I, I love it. I mean, this is what Jesus has taught us and it's the teaching in every spiritual tradition. What you're seeing on your screen right now is a big, huge meditation hall that's made all, it's made out of white marble. It's huge. The top floor of this particular uh, meditation hall can hold 5,000 people sitting on the floor. There are no columns at all. Um, and it's a place where people meditate and they offer prayers on a daily basis. It's located in a very sacred forest on some very deep and powerful ground. And I've been going to this place um, even before it was built. I, I went there in 2006 before they actually had completed the temple at all. This is a picture of uh, a group of my classmates having taken a course and we all gathered after our course in front of the temple. Uh, there were people from all over the world. As you can see, it, it's a, it was a good sized group, but nothing like when everybody comes there, there were probably maybe 500 people there. Um, it's, it's a very powerful energy field, a very powerful place. There are 11 campuses that this O&O Academy, which is Oneness and One World Academy owns. They are now currently teaching classes online. Before I used to have to go to India, but right now things are happening online and that's why I'm able to teach online. Um, what I wanted to kind of, I wanna just give you a few teachings. There's so many things that I could share, but there are just a few things that I, I think are important for us to anchor in um, as we align the world wisdom tr traditions, which when we used to have uh, Unity of Berkeley, every August was world wisdom tradition. And I would have a Sufi, I'd have a Buddhist teacher, we had a, a rabbi come, we would have somebody from uh, a, a Muslim faith. We had people from all different faiths who would offer us the insights from their wisdom and then do some sort of workshop. So I just thought, I'm just gonna pretend that's what it is. August, it's my world wisdom and I'm gonna share mine. So this is a picture that I actually took uh, at one of the campuses of a lotus flower. And I think a lot of times we just see the flower blossoming and we don't realize that the lotus is actually stuck in the mud. And at night, that flower closes up, but when the sun comes in the morning, they open up. They're sitting on lily pods as well. The lotus flower is this most exquisite symbol of literally the transformation and consciousness that all of us are called to in our life. And, you know, I mean, I can read what this says. The lotus flower is regarded in many cultures, especially in Eastern spirituality, as a symbol of purity, of enlightenment, of self regeneration and rebirth. Its characteristics are a perfect analogy for the human condition, even when its roots are in the dirtiest waters, the lotus produces the most beautiful flower. And I think, you know, this is such an important thing for us to remember. In our teachings of unity, we talk about Christ consciousness. We talk about this is, uh, the Christ consciousness is happening for us. But in the teachings of the East, what they're talking about is awakening or enlightenment. They are one and the same. Christ consciousness is the same thing as awakening. Christ consciousness is the same thing as enlightenment. It's moving us into higher and higher states of consciousness. And that's what the lotus flower is representational for all of us. Um, I wanted to just show this picture because it's a very interesting thing about a Hindu temple. You know, we, in our, our churches, we, we create everything with a sense of sacred reverence, Everything is clear, clean. We're lighting candles. You know, we might have image like Mother Mary, like Sarah's song. I loved your song. That was so beautiful. Thank you, Sarah. Mother Mary, we might have a, an image of Jesus. But a Hindu temple is a really different place. And this is one of the things about being in India and beginning to kind of understand the culture there is the Hindu temples are adorned. This is the outside of a Hindu temple. And you would see the whole building is covered with these statues. And the statues aren't just like pious. The statues represent all different aspects of human life. As this slide says, it's the ordinary. It's the lustful, the satisfied, the angry, the peaceful, the mighty, and the meek. And it's an, it's an understanding that 
all of these qualities are part of the human nature. They're part of our human nature. And yet, when we enter a temple, when we move into that place of divine consciousness, we're connecting in with the higher consciousness. In, in India, every day, families will all gather around a small altar. And they'll offer prayers. They'll offer light. They call it arti. They'll do a blessing to the divine presence. It might be that there's a particular statue there that they are focusing on. Because in, Indi in Indian culture, in a Hindu culture, kind of like we have the 12 powers. They've got a lot more than 12. But it's, they have these representational beings, gods and goddesses, that represent certain aspects of our human experience. And so someone might be praying to Lakshmi, for instance. Lakshmi, who is a goddess of beauty, a goddess of abundance, a goddess of wealth. Somebody might be praying to uh, the goddess uh, Ganesha, the elephant Ganesha which is all about, again, abundance and moving obstacles out of the way. So in a, in a family in India, the whole family would gather first thing in the morning and they would pray together in that way at their own sacred altar. Very different than kind of how we operate in our own culture and maybe just go on Sunday. Although I think a lot more people are using a daily time of stillness and meditation in their life to reconnect to those higher states of consciousness, the Christ consciousness, the awakened consciousness. So I just wanted to share some of these things that I think if you, if you know this, it might just bring a little more awareness to the practices that you have in terms of your prayer practice, and also more of an opening to a welcoming of people of other cultures and other traditions. We all have heard the word namaste. And, you know, I think sometimes I just kind of say that because I'm used to being in India. If you're walking down the street in India, people, they may not go like this, but they'll touch the side, like, like they touch their heart and they'll just kind of nod. It's like the divine in me greets the divine in you. I, the, the best part of me, the most exquisite part of me that the divine knows who I am sees and knows that most beautiful, precious part of you. That's what the namaste means. And it's interesting for us to understand this posture of namaste. The posture of namaste is very, very sacred. And it also has a very body-based understanding. When we put our palms together like this, we're actually joining the two hemispheres of the brain. So when we put our hands together in this posture and place them in front of our heart, it's an anchoring of the heart and the mind. It's a beautiful, beautiful way to anchor the heart and the mind. And you'll find in Easter traditions, the prayer, they're very often asking you to put your hands in what they call namaskar mudra. Mudra is a hand posture. Because they're very aware of how the body and the aspects of the body impact all of the systems inside our, our physical, emotional, and spiritual bodies. So I'd like to share a little bit um, about that with you and also do a really, really simple uh, breath practice because I just am letting it rip. That's why. <laughs> so this particular picture is a picture, uh, it's an, and it's a mirror picture of the body. And you'll see that there is kind of a, like a crisscrossing that's going up through the middle. If you think of it like two different rivers and they're meeting at different towns in the middle, that's kind of what I thought of here. Um, each of the dots that you see are like a vortex of energy, like a little wheel of energy. This system is called the um, subtle body nadi, N-A-D-I system. And just like many of you may know of the Chinese culture where they talk about meridians and the, we have a lot of meridians and when you have acupuncture or even acupressure, they're actually activating those individual channels in the body. Well, in the Hindu culture, they have the same understanding and they see that there are 72,000 of these channels running through the body. And the main channels, there are three main channels that run through the body. And those three main channels literally crisscross as they go through the center of the body coming up in front of the spine. The first channel is a channel that activates the energy of the moon. 
And it's interesting to think about this because, you know, we, we know our bodies are made of a lot of water. And we talk about ourselves being one with all life. We're one with the plants. We're one with animals. We're one with the air. We're connected in such a vibrant way. But I don't think we often think, oh, I'm one with the moon or I'm one with the sun. But, but the Hindu culture and the, the yogis were able to see these energies, the lunar energy and the solar energy, as it moved through the body. And what they, what they invite us to do is literally balance the energies in our body, the solar and lunar energy. The lunar energy is running up, and it runs up through your left nostril. If you breathe, take a moment right now and just put your... Put your hand under your nose. Don't touch your nose. Just put it right under your nose and notice that one nostril is more, more strongly breathing than the other. Just notice as you exhale. Throughout the day, that the, the breath alternates between the lunar and the solar energies in the body. And so we have an opportunity to actually balance this energy by doing a really simple breath practice. So I thought I would try it with you if you're up for it. It's so very easy. What you're going to do is you're going to, you can use your thumb and your, and your pointer finger. You're going to close your, close your right nostril. So you're going to be, you're going to inhale through your left nostril. Then you're going to close both nostrils and hold your breath. Hold it as long as you're comfortable. And then you're going to open that nostril again. Open the left nostril and exhale. So let's do that three times. So inhale, close your nostrils, hold your breath as long as comfortable. And when you're ready, open up that finger, open up the left nostril and exhale slowly. So do that, try that three times at your own pace. Slowly is good. Left nostril only. And when you've done the left, then move over to the right nostril and open up your thumb and inhale with the right nostril and hold your breath. Close the nostrils. And then exhale again through the right nostril. And do that practice another three times slowly. Just notice how the body feels. Just feel your breathing. Mm -hmm. Nice, nice. So I'd invite you to open your eyes. It's such a simple thing to do. And it brings us into a nice state of calm because you're literally balancing the streams of energy that are coming up. They're called the Ida and the Pingala, but you don't need to know that so much. You're balancing those energies. And when those energies are balanced, the energy that comes up from the base of the body that goes up to the top of the head that really activates these higher states of consciousness, that energy can flow freely. When our energies are out of balance, when you're, you know, Ravana and you've got lots of things happening here, uh, it's very hard for the energy in the physical body and the subtle energy body to move up and, and really lower lower that activity that's happening in the brain. 
So there's, um, there's so many wonderful things that, that I could share with you. I want to just take a minute um, just to see if anybody has any questions um, before we are going to move into the Buddhist chant of compassion. I did not know the daily word was compassion. That was like, totally. I just want to see if anyone has any questions of, of any of the things that I shared. This is like such a little tiny slice. But, uh, you know, it's important to understand that so much of Charles Fillmore's teachings, like the law of mind action, is the law of karma. It it's the same thing that what goes around comes around. Thoughts and mind create, produce after their kind. And again, it's always thoughts and mind are about the combination of the mind and heart. So as Unity students, you know, in 2013, I took 30, 53 Unity ministers and board members to, to India to have a special course. And it was because they were so much in alignment with the teachings that are being given of world wisdom tradition. So I just want us to kind of expand as we say in our statement that we listen about the teachers of Jesus and also other spiritual traditions. As we open that up, we open our community up in such a beautiful, powerful way. So does, if anybody has any questions, if not, I'm gonna do the, the chant. Awesome, okay. Thank you all for indulging me, let her rip today. So the Buddhist chant of compassion is a chant that many people all over the world chant, and not just Buddhists. The chant is Om Mane Padme Hum, Om Mane Padme Hum. And the way it's translated is praise to the jewel in the lotus. And if you think about the jewel as this higher consciousness, this beauty, this wisdom, this joy, this connection, this, this divine love that Jesus called us into, this is the jewel of the lotus. And that's why, you know, the Buddhists can, can chant this, we can chant this, knowing that, yes, we may often feel like our roots are in the mud, or we may be like Ravana with many things going on and dealing with what we're dealing in our life. But there is this beauty, this connection, this divine jewel of higher consciousness that we can always tune into in our lives. And hopefully balancing with the breath is a way to help you. And I have this, um, this little short um, YouTube of a one minute practice that I'd love to have you share with us. Uh, so just invite you, you're muted and I'm not gonna sing. I'm gonna mute myself too. So uh, invite you to listen and, and chant along. Let's go. Om Mani Padme Hum. 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 I'm grateful for the opportunity to let her rip with all of you and to share a little tiny slice of my uh, passion for connecting the world wisdoms and all that I um, have shared in India and with unity. So thank you for indulging me in that regard.
beautiful message today. And Anne, we're going to move into our offering. 